Sorry, I don't want to dominate. No, you know uh, the the practice of the practice of female genital mutilation. Have you heard of this? Where women's genitals are maybe cut in the name of culture, in the name of tradition. Okay, but if I continue to call it culture and tradition, okay, I am forgetting that there is a particular power there huh, that is at stake that needs to be exposed and figured out so that the harm is stopped. That's my, my take on it, right? Mm -hmm. There's gonna be an argument over it. No, this is part of our tradition. If I go between two opposites and say, oh, this is your tradition and I have a different tradition, I leave it there, especially if I'm part of that context. Mm -hmm. I'm a Muslim, I'm an Arab, and, and they're referring that practice to Islam. Yet Islam never, never asked for that. Okay? So how do I argue this? It is not the tradition. Unless I work with discourses, unless I look at power, how sexism, how gender injustice works within that kind of practice, I'm not going to be able to unpack it and maybe make a change. Maybe make a change. Right? That's why the, the yeah. That's why the debate over a genital female mutilation has taken too long in Africa. Mm -hmm. Too long. And if you think about the more you're able to use sophisticated language, I don't mean not accessible, but smart language to unpack the oppressions, the better we are. We are, and the better, the more change we make. So that's why, I, to close this, maybe, I really invite you to take a look at more a critical, anti-oppressive, anti-racist, uh, um, indigenous feminist uh, uh, work. Yeah. So, so, so you mentioned you don't like to use the word culture. Does that mean, to me, it's kind of, you, you think, uh, if you use the word culture, it kind of, we kind of cover those racism and classism. We are, we are not able to disclose. Right, right. So I, I give you an example. You know, the, the argument now um, in, in two places that I'm looking at in another research project, in Tunisia and Egypt, in, in this moment of revolution, long moment of revolution. So Islamist regimes came in and said, it's not in our culture. I don't know what that means. To have women be in the streets or be in higher political positions. That's a patriarchal sexist discourse. It is not Islam. Okay. Right? And it's not the culture. Right? Okay. Yeah. yeah I have a question, general question. Why always the media, the researcher, the people look for hijab or Muslim woman, like they are oppressed and they're oppressed. Right. But for example, none, none, they wear hijab, they wear long dress, but nobody focus on them like they are under op oppress oppression. Yes. Like Muslim woman. Right. I would like you to read, all of you, to read what I, it says. Well, What's the, uh, on page 495 of the, of the article, there was a conversation between Amy, Abby, and Leila in which, oh, I'm just going to read the quotes. My, my mom says it is because the, okay, it is not fair Muslim men can date non-Muslim women and my mom says that it is because the man is the head of the household. And that may have something to do with it. Me, the, 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 the man, if the man is interpreted as the head of the household, they are not seen as oppressed. Ahmed, you can't take that quote out of context. Oh dear. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. So, to answer you, you need to read Layla Ahmed, because she talks about the history of the veil, with this part, from Judaism to Christianity to Islam. Layla Abu Lughut does a great job on that too. And, 
another thing when I read the article. But may I finish? May okay. I finish? Yeah. So, but this is a signifier, we say, a symbol that is used to uh, develop the imaginary of the West about Muslims through the uh, Muslim woman body, that they are, they are oppressed, they are less than us, they are patriarchal, and we are way better, than we're modern, we're better for our women. Huh? So we need to go and save them and wage a war on Afghanistan. So the media, okay, is a tool for that hegemony to go through the minds of the people that need to be controlled in this country. Of course, of course, women are not oppressed. My grandmother was a, a feminist before you and me, right? She was a religious woman. Doesn't matter. You, you, you really need to look where at, at Muslim women's history in different contexts and realize what powerful and how powerful they are. <coughs> and you want to mark my word that I'm not being racist here. I'm looking at the, the work of Egyptian women at this point more than the Tunisian women. I think they're going to change our world. They're going to shift the world for us. And they are mostly Muslim. And they are all Arab. So if the hint of an idea comes into your mind that a Muslim woman is oppressed, rethink it and check your racist meeting. I mean, with all my respect, I'm not pointing at somebody here. Yeah? Time for one question or comment. Okay. Uh, it's, it's still related to power. <laughs> and uh, can I use your name? <laughs> okay. Um, because I was thinking, uh, what's the role of power in national research um, in relation to the <coughs> facilitator? Because it seems that we, we never reach it. Uh, the perfection of sharing of power that is an ideal <coughs> democracy of course <coughs> uh, this is a this is a myth if you think as a researcher that especially a researcher who's a teacher who has money right mm -hmm. or money that can uh, make the curriculum move and education happen it, that's that kind of sharing is always going to be um, uh, uh, framed by this, the powers that this researcher has. It never goes away. It never goes away, but the issue here, and this is also a missing piece that we don't get when we teach qualitative research or research, is that you cannot do action research without continuously going through the circle of checking through your theories and your methodology that depends on that theory and do what I'm telling you, self-critical self-reflexivity, continuously. Yeah? Yeah, 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 it's tough, it is tough. Unless you are inside it, or you read enough articles that really work with that, then it becomes, it makes sense. And this self reflexivity is a, a way to use this power positively, right? As much as, as possible. But at, at points you can be called on it, right? You could make mistakes, mm -hmm. you could hurt the participants, but there should be, a, a, um, a channel of working this through. Yeah. One last question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, most of us are in the second semester of the the program. Um, so if we want to do qualitative research, what what suggestion do you have for us? Or shall we take more copies? Or thank you. What, what is my question? Yeah. Right. You you offer. You know, I have I have spoken with some of my colleagues. I haven't talked to uh, Dr. Hines right. I was the head of the department. I really believe there should be two uh, sections of this course. Like uh, first, you know, first part, part part one and part two. That should be part one and part two. That's that's where you will um, bring your data and start really analyzing it. I don't think you can learn. Everything that you need to learn about quality research method in one semester, and yeah, that's I'm hoping to continue to push for it because I think it's something that's going to be benefit from. Yeah. So if, if if the uh, the courses are not offered and if we want to do the quality research, what shall we do on ourselves? Though 
I invite you to take my course in the spring. You can so take her course. We have some. I have some CNI students who take it. It's the research uh, feminist methods. It's called feminist methods in the books. And women's studies. And why you pick Canada as your research? Yeah. One of your research classes. So it's not just an extra class. You know, you have to take 576. You have to take yeah. the, the quantitative one. And then you have to take two other ones that you have the option for. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so you can take that. Um, and we, we have collaborated, of course, this is my home department also, but uh, I have many mm -hmm. CNI students who took the class with me. And I, we only offer it in the spring. And I also am advocating to have a second section or another sequence to it because students say it's really hard to do it all in one semester. Absolutely. And I really work them hard. I would strongly encourage you. <laughs> you shouldn't have told us that. <laughs> I, I can be biased because uh, Manal, like what I call it, Dr. Hamzi, uh, is a friend, his colleague. I would strongly encourage you to take a class with her. Romina Pacheco was here two weeks ago, took a class with her, and uh, she had a great time learning while learning uh, in her class. So uh, I can be biased because she's a friend. Yeah. But mm -hmm. she's, I've heard so many good things about her class. If you need to know more about Feminist research, research method, absolutely. Take but at the same time, if it doesn't work with you in your schedule, and you want to come and talk to me at some point, and you say, Manel, what are the readings that you suggest? I'm more than happy to share. Yeah. On that note, we're going to have to end it there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. Thank, you. Thank 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 you.